Hey everybody, so uh, this week I'm uh, taking a break from making or, or doing anything D&D uh, &D related. I'm doing Frostgrave stuff, working on a modular Frostgrave table. And um, I was really, really happy with, uh, with how these guys turned out. The, um, the, the one thing, the big, big win for me was that they're so modular that even when I mix and match them and like put them on top of each other and everything, it, they pretty much look seamless. Like I can just put them anywhere and they, you know, uh, look like like a, a badass uh, dungeon. So uh, yeah. Anyways, um, let's uh, yeah, let's get on with those. Let's do some arts and crafts. So uh, I have some test pieces that I made. Um, so this is a uh, pink stuff insulation foam and uh, and then this is um, it's this is actually this is infinity terrain um, so infinity um, you know it's a it's another skirmish game it's um, like a sci-fi kind of skirmish game and uh, it comes with a lot of this kind of stuff like if you buy a box set this is um, Eugene terrain, but it's just, you know, cardboard or like mm, cereal box kind of stuff. And you could totally do that. You could do that with like cereal box or whatever. I just had this lying around and I thought, oh, I wonder if I could make frost grain or frost grave terrain out of this stuff. Um, so this is, this is one of these, but I just glued foam core to the side and then kind of textured it. And, uh, but the big win for me is that these are my new dungeon tiles, my new uh, modular frost grave tiles. And um, they, uh, they go great with this stuff. Like you, you can't even really, even though they have a lot of texture to them, it can rest on top of it. And then, you know, if you're standing above it, looking down at it, it looks, you know, it looks fine. It looks great. But, um, uh, these, I went ahead and like scaled up. This is, this again, this is more infinity terrain. Um, I went ahead and scaled up and I started working on this guy. Um, but jury's still out on this stuff. So I might do a video on these later. I might make, I may make more of these. The thing is, is that these, so this is, uh, this is Ariadna. This is, um, Ariadna terrain. And then this is Eugene, and they aren't a consistent size. Like the, they're kind of are, but not exactly. So that's a, that's an issue. Um, if I want things to like butt up against each other, or if I want to um, make bridges and things like that, um, I want them to be a consistent size. So that's one of the nice things about the. Um, the pink stuff, you know, the insulation foam is that it's exactly, you know, an inch thick. And then I can uh, like scale it up or scale it down however much I want to in inches. And then my grid system is based on, like, on inches too. So, you know, I thought about future proofing. I, um, I really like 32 mil miniatures. I just, um, I like them a lot. And I've thought about future proofing and making one and a quarter inch grid stuff. Um, but I've already made a lot of like one inch kind of grid stuff. Um, this is this is all kind of based on like a four by four inch system. So I have tiles that are, you know, four, four by four inches. I have ones that are eight by eight and then, you know, up to like a foot. So yeah, for now, I'm, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep making more of these because uh, I because I really like the way these look. I like how you, how I can sculpt into them, and then I feel like the the foam core, even though it's cheap, and I can just glue it to like you know like a Kleenex box or something and make a piece of terrain out of that. Um, I I like this better, and pink stuff is not that expensive. Pink stuff. It's like $7 for a giant sheet that's like, 
you know, three feet by three feet or something like that. So it's not, it's not much more than foam core is for a big sheet of foam core. But, uh, but yeah, let's make some more of this stuff. So uh, to start with, I had a few little two by two squares, uh, two inch by two inch that I cut out. And then um, I'm using some Gorilla foam glue, well, Gorilla glue, which is a, a foam based glue. And um, so it won't melt the foam, it won't melt um, XPS extruded polystyrene foam, this stuff, insulation foam, it won't melt foam core and uh, it creates like an indestructible bond. And then later, if you want to use like a hot wire foam cutter or something on it, you can do that too. But, uh, but yeah, so I'm using that stuff, but a little bit goes a long way. This stuff, it expands and then it came gushing out of the sides. I mean, not, not too bad, but in some spots on the bigger pieces, it came out a lot. So I'm gonna make some little toppers out of foam core. And uh, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to cut the um, toppers out of foam core and I'm going to take, uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna do my little grids on the top. So, I'm, so these guys are four by fours. And then I'm going to mark out my grids on one side of the paper. Uh, and then I'm going to take the, the paper backing off of the other side and then glue that side down um, so that it's foam on foam so that there's no little pieces of paper sticking out anywhere uh, when, um, when I have the foam on foam pieces. And I'm going to leave the paper on the other side though because I'm going to wait until I start texturing them to peel it off because I'm going to use that as part of my stone texture when I'm, uh, when I'm uh, distressing those later. So after everything has cured, um, and it doesn't take that long to cure, it takes a little while. The um, the gorilla foam stuff it takes a, you know it takes a little while to cure but not like 24 hours like PVA glue or um, and and you know if you're using hot uh, hot glue like a hot glue gun you can leave that stuff in your car and uh, it can get hot and then everything can come unglued so this stuff is it's good you know it makes a pretty indestructible bond and then. Um, uh, it's you can texture it like foam too. So uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna um, just sort of cut some stone shapes out of the sides of these guys, and then I'm just gonna go to work on it, kind of distressing it and um, making texture. But th this is one of the cool things that I like about the pink stuff is that you can carve into it and make all kinds of shapes and stuff like that, and it's more of like a removal process than an additive process like with foam core like if you like with the other pieces that i made where i was gluing them to uh like boxes and and again these guys are all just going to have a consistent size which is really going to help like they're going to be four by four inch squares or when i scale up they're going to be a certain you know inch by inch system of squares or whatever and uh, yeah so I'm gonna use the, the pink stuff to sort of destroy it and then I'm gonna use the foam core to make some little toppers for them and uh, this is something that I started doing with the uh, the foam core when I'm texturing it is that I'll just peel off a piece and then if it doesn't come off right away then that's where a crack is. So I sort of use it like as a, um, to make some really natural looking shapes. 
Like uh, when I'm when I'm destroying things, I'm just I'm, I'm letting the medium speak to me. I'm letting it, it tell me what kind of shape it wants to take. <laughs> So uh, after I have some little shapes cut out, there's a, a few things that I like to do to add some texture. So uh, one thing that I'll, I'll, I like to do is um, use like a wire brush. And uh, the wire brush is going to take off all those hard edges um, because nature doesn't build in straight lines, only people do. So it's going to sort of soften some of those hard edges and give a more weathered looking effect. And uh, also I want some little kind of striations in the stone to make it look, well, more of like a, a slate kind of texture. And uh, another thing that I'll do is I'll use uh, sandpaper to do the same thing. And if a spot looks kind of soft and squishy, then maybe I'll cut that off because that's where something got sheared off by the rain and wind, uh, etc. Like uh, Frostgrave, the city is supposed to be abandoned for like a millennia, like a thousand years or something. And then um, it's supposed to just be like perpetually frozen, like perma winter. So I was kind of trying to picture how that would affect stones. And also there's a mechanic to Frostgrave. So every piece of terrain is climbable because supposedly they, it's so weathered and so destroyed that there's no like sheer faces on anything. There's that you could find a little foothold or a crack in, in everything that it is in Frostgrave. So if you're like climbing as part of one of your move actions, um, you don't necessarily have to put your mini up a wall, but you can put a dice next to him to kind of like delineate how far he is up the wall. But uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna use like a combination of like the wire brush, the, um, the X-Acto knife and uh, some, um, sandpaper and uh and then you know you could use like a rock and like push it in there to get some texture and uh so one one other thing that i like to do and uh is i'll use a heat gun and then the heat gun will kind of um like uh seal up the pores <laughs> of the of the foam and then kind of make it like retract a little bit so it's going to show like the little cuts from the masonry that I made in there, but you don't need a heat gun to do that. You like you could use a um, uh, like a hair dryer or something like that, or just you know sculpt it with an exacto. But the heat gun is gonna make it kind of seal up a little bit too, so like that rough texture that's in the cracks is gonna kind of turn more into like. Uh, smooth weathered um, masonry <laughs> and uh, yeah it's just gonna kind of I'm just gonna barely melt it just a little bit to add a little bit of texture it's just an easy way to um, to add a little bit more weathering and and yeah and then you know go back over it with the sandpaper to take more of those hard edges off and um, get rid of any burn spots if I have any um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I'm going to do for texturing. I'm not going to add anything else. I'm not going to put in any, um, anything into the cracks or anything. Just going to remove and then heat it up and sand it off. So I went ahead and scaled up, uh, to make a bigger piece as well. And, uh, this guy is six by six, I believe. And I know that goes against my uh, eight, eight by eight inch tiles, but this is actually for uh, a specific, um, there's a lot of uh, um, uh, missions in Frostgrave that call for like a six by six tile like this, like a piece of raised terrain. Like the, the, the very first mission in the book 
calls for like a raised six by six inch piece of terrain. So the, uh, what I'm, yeah, what I'm doing right now is I'm using a fork to kind of just dig in there with the tines. And then uh, that's another easy way that you can add some texture, like removing uh, texture. So uh, yeah, on this piece, I wanted the wall, the walls to look like they were scalable. Like you could just sort of climb up the walls. And, uh, but I also wanted a, a piece of uh, broken ground that went up towards the middle that um, was just like rough terrain. It wasn't, it wouldn't necessarily be like scalable or you wouldn't have to climb it. It would just be like, uh, you'd have to slow down so you wouldn't trip and fall. So before I start painting, I'm gonna seal everything. And uh, all this is, is it's uh, Mod Podge. And, uh, and then I, I put like most of a tube of Payne's Gray paint in there. So uh, the Payne's Gray paint is not black. It's, uh, it's a dark gray, but it's a cool gray. So it has like some kind of like blues and some, some uh, greens, which is gonna be perfect for uh, the slate later when I'm trying to get that. And it also works as kind of like a mid-tone. So like when I, when I am painting it, I'll put in shadows and I'll also put in highlights, but this is just gonna be kind of like that mid gray that I want for, for the piece to be like a regular kind of tone. And uh, I am gonna slop it on there. I'm not gonna be careful with it at all because uh, I, 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 you know, I even ended up either needing to do multiple coats of this or I ended up needing to paint again later. So yeah, like just slop it on because it'll keep soaking it up. So uh, instead of using paint paint, I am gonna paint, but I'm gonna use pastels or, uh, or um, pan pigments. So yeah, these are uh, pan pastels and it's basically just pigments in, in a pan. Um, and then uh, I'm just gonna brush those on there. So yeah, if you look closely at the pillars, um, you can see that there's still some pink showing through. And uh, so the, um, the, the pigments are gonna get rid of that. They're gonna get rid of the pink because they're gonna settle in the recesses a lot. And um, they, they don't behave like normal paint does, like they settle in the cracks and everything, and they basically stain. They don't, um, you know, they don't, they don't permanently um, coat like a paint does. So um, after I'm done brushing on pigments, then I'm gonna need to do something to seal those. Um, so I'll, after I've got it kind of how I want it, um, and I tend to like kind of just slop on pigments and then blend them together, because um, when, you, when you do seal it down, um, typically like if you're using um, like a, a varnish or a lacquer or something like that, it's gonna dull down the pigments when you're actually sealing them to the to the models, so I'll just I'll just slop it on there, blend it together, and uh, and then see how it looks after I put some varnish on there. But uh, even though this isn't my final paint layer, I'm still gonna try and focus my lighter pigments on the tops of the models. So yeah, work from dark to light, just like you would with normal paint with uh, pigments. And I'm gonna seal everything down with a layer of some dull coat. Outside. So now I'm gonna start doing a little bit of dry brushing. And uh, this is actually gonna be my, my very last paint layer, just this last little bit of dry brush. So the, you know, the pigments are all sealed down 
and uh, they're the, it's stained the model really good, and it, yeah, they they look really natural because they're natural kind of earth tones. And, uh, and now I'm using a little bit more Payne's Gray and some unbleached titanium, which is uh, titanium white that has not been bleached white, or titanium buff is another thing that they call it. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna mix those together to get another nice light kind of uh, natural looking stone tone. And uh, I'm gonna use a big makeup brush to, to do this because um, makeup brushes are just, they're fantastic for doing big pieces of terrain. Um, they're, you know, they're big and they're soft. They don't hold a ton of paint and uh, they just, they work great for dry brushing big pieces like this. So yeah, again, you know, light, lightest, um, lightest highlights on the tops of the models. And, uh, and then I'm gonna work down and um, try to brush the sides too and try and sort of brush downward so that it looks like the light is uh, hitting those uh, raised edges in a, in a downward angle. And uh, also, I want these guys to be a little bit lighter than my terrain tiles. I want them to kind of stand out a little bit more and I want a little bit more contrast too, because it's a 3D piece. So, um, yeah, like, you know, I always say it like, contrast is your friend when you're looking at little dudes from far away. You know, it's like, it makes things stand out and it makes all the little details visible. And it's like, what's the point of doing all that sculpting if you aren't gonna pick out the details? So uh, when I scaled up, the, the one thing that I did differently, um, so I sealed it the same way. I used the, the Mod Podge and uh, some Payne's Gray paint. And, uh, but then I decided that, you know, it's, it's dumb like painting a big thing like this with a, with a paintbrush. So I broke out the airbrush to do it. But uh, since I broke out the airbrush, you know, I, I, I got to do some airbrushing. So um, yeah, I, I tried to hit it at a sort of, give it a little bit of a zenithal kind of coat. So um, I'm going at sort of like a 45 degree angle with a, a gray. And then I did like a little bit of kind of anti-zenithal um, coat with like a, a black to in some areas to uh, create some shadows to, to put some shadows back in. But um, I, uh, I wanted to see what it would look like if I put some greens and then some kind of uh, yellow ochres in there because I felt like that was missing from the other guys. Like if I would have done this all over again, I would think I would have airbrushed it this way. So I wanted to put some greens in there and I wanted to put some yellows in there to kind of add some, um, some nice uh, stone uh, colors, some nice slate kind of colors, as well as doing the, the dry brushing with the pigments. So that part's all the same, but, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna use the airbrush to, to paint before and then let do that some of the heavy lifting before I start putting in pigments and then dry brushing. But the, uh, the airbrush is a really wonderful tool for especially for doing big pieces like this. If you want to cover a lot of area really quickly and have it have, you know, smooth, creamy, uh, um, nice blends and, you know, look uh, natural instead of like choppy, the airbrush is just a really, really wonderful tool for that. So here's a picture of what it looks like with all of the uh, with all my minis. Um, I'm not gonna do a turnaround this time because there's just too much of this stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna keep working on this stuff and um, 
you know, I'm, I plan on doing a, a Frostgrave battle report as soon as it's all done to celebrate. There's a few more minis and a few more pieces of terrain that I want to get done, but uh, yeah, it's, it's happening. Frostgrave is happening. All right. Thanks for watching, you guys. Uh, take care of yourselves.